Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. Thanks so much for tuning in. If you're new here, welcome. I'm so glad that you're here. I'm so glad you found me. If you've been here before, welcome back. I'm so glad that you're here to hang out today and I can't wait. So I've decided to stick with this style of dressing, uh, the sweaters and the big t-shirts instead of the way that I used to dress in my videos. Because I'm not gonna lie, it's been really nice for the last two videos not getting called a whore once a day. You'd be surprised at the nasty things that people do not feel bad about commenting on my videos. I get very low user engagement, but at least half of it is women telling me that I should be ashamed of myself, I'm a slut, I'm a whore, I'm a bad influence on little girls, blah blah blah. So I typically try to ignore people who say stuff like that, but Having the last few videos where I'm not getting constantly attacked for the way that I dress and the things that I'm showing has been kind of nice, not gonna lie. So I think it's unanimous and this is the way that I should be dressing. So this is the way I am going to dress. So uh, expect that from now on. I've always absolutely despised Vito Genovese. This guy reminds me of the rat from Harry Potter. You know the guy that like literally turns into a rat? His name is Peter Pettigrew. As a human, he acts like a rat and that is exactly who I think of when I think of Vito Genovese. I don't think of his actual picture. I think of Peter Pettigrew. When Luciano and Costello along with Lansky and Siegel started working for Arnold Rothstein, Rothstein financed the entire crew's illegal activities he helped finance the bootlegging, he helped finance the drugs so that they could buy the drugs so that they could sell them, and just pretty much gave them money and loans to do whatever they needed to do. When the crew grew from the original four to the 20, one of the people that came on board was Vito Genovese. Genovese is actual literal swine, like the worst grossest human being in all of mankind. He had a serious issue working with Lansky and Siegel. When Luciano brought them to meet Genovese for the first time because he had had kind of this crew of new people working away from Lansky and Siegel so that they could kind of protect themselves. So when he brought Lansky and Siegel around for the first time, Genovese turned around to Luciano and said, what are you trying to do? Load us up with a bunch of heebs? Like he's always done, Luciano put him in his place real freaking quick. Luciano responded, take it easy, Don Vitone. You're nothing but a fucking foreigner yourself. Like most other times that Luciano shut his shit down, he sat down and shut the hell up and had nothing further to say. Luciano became the leader of one of the five families in New York as promised, and he made Genovese his underboss. Probably the biggest mistake that he ever made. He left Genovese in place as the acting boss of his family because Genovese was his underboss. That's, that's usually what happens. The only problem was that Genovese actually ended up fleeing the U.S. and headed to Naples to avoid a murder indictment. Genovese was fleeing from an indictment of Ferdinand Baccia, a fellow member of the Mafia. Genovese scammed this wealthy gambler out of like $150,000 in a high-stakes card game. And this high-stakes card game is what makes me think that when Arnold Rothstein said that he had lost all this money and it was like a scam, like that's what makes me think like, yeah, it probably was a scam because of this situation. Genovese got his hands on this wealthy gambler. He scammed him out of $150,000. So yeah, Arnold Rothstein probably was killed because he was scammed. But anyway, Baccia is the one that introduced Genovese to this wealthy gambler, so he demanded $35,000 as pretty much like a finder's fee for introducing Genovese to this gambler. Genovese and five of his associates decided to kill Baccia on September 19th, 1934, rather than just pay him the $35,000. After Luciano was given the 30 to 50 year prison sentence, Genovese got spooked. 
that he was going to be indicted on this murder, and he must have gotten a tip or something that someone was working with the DA's office because it really doesn't make sense any other way. They really were coming for him. He wasn't crazy. He left for Italy on November 26th, 1936, which is two years after they killed this man. So it wasn't just, you know, him going crazy. Like, he had a reason to run. So however he got word, he got word that they were coming and he jets off on November 25th. When he got to Italy, he went to Nola, a city near Naples. I've always absolutely despised Vito Genovese. Legit, every single episode that I have ever mentioned his name, I've made sure to call him like a scumbag, a scuzz bucket, something nasty. I always make sure to throw that in. I will never do an episode on him for the same reason I'll never do an episode on a rat. I just, I hate them. I hate who they are down to their very fiber of being. I never knew the extent for which I had a right to hate Genovese though. So we're going to go through that here. We know Genovese had to flee the U.S. when Luciano got arrested, but what I personally did not know was that Genovese made nicey-nice with Mussolini in Italy. Yeah, that guy that was BFFs with Hitler and, like, wanted to kill all the Jewish people in the world? The fascist government that had mafia members, women and children beaten, raped, and killed? Like, yeah, there's Genovese's BFF. By the end of World War II, Genovese had donated nearly $4 million to Mussolini's fascist party. That would be a little over $81 million today. Not only was he friendly with them, but he organized hits in America on their behalf. That means that he had people killed that were against the fascists. It blows my mind that this man should have been hung in the town square for war crimes, and he wasn't. Like, who's friends with the fascists? Literally everybody hated them. Everybody. And this man's out here giving them $81 million and killing people for them. The entire mafia in America was against the fascists. Every single one of them were against him. He arranged for the murder of Carlo Tresca to happen in America from Italy. Tresco was the publisher of an anarchist newspaper in New York, and apparently that made him enemy number one to Mussolini, so he had to go. Genovese made the call, and Tresco was killed on January 11th, 1943, by a gunman outside his office in Manhattan. On top of that, Genovese also helped to create a new fascist party headquarters in NOLA, and he was awarded the Order of the Saints Maurice and Lazarus and made a commendatory, which is a member of the Italian Honorary Order of Chivalry, who ranks next above an officer and next below a grand officer, pretty much making him a commander in the Italian forces all by Mussolini. It's beyond me how after World War II, when they took the officers who worked for Hitler and lined them up and shot them, Genovese wasn't among those people being shot down. They just allowed him to come back to America and be a mafia boss. Like, out of control. Out of control. Allegedly, he did this to make life for himself easier, but having people in the States killed for them is not just making your life easier. There's being nice, there's trying not to piss someone off, and being friends with somebody, and then there's being nice, donating $81 million to them, and having somebody killed in a different country for them. Three totally different levels of being nice. Now, the Allied invasion goes down in September of 1943. I went into a lot of detail about this invasion in my Luciano video, so again, if that's something that you're interested in, go check out that video. I went into it a lot because Luciano actually had a huge hand in helping set up the Allied invasion, and this was a huge reason why the U.S. was able to invade so easily and win control of Italy so easily and quickly and efficiently. On July 25th, 1943, the people of Italy voted Benito Mussolini out of power. He was arrested upon leaving a meeting with King Vittorio Emmanuel, who had stated that the war was already lost. This is another subject I went into a lot in the Luciano video, but a quick version. Italy had a king at the time. It was later voted to become a republic, and the king and his family were exiled 
because they worked with Mussolini. But the king had fought Mussolini for a really long time and eventually just kind of like said, whatever, I'm done fighting, do what you got to do. And when he did that, Mussolini turned around and signed a pact with Japan and Germany and declared war on the Allied powers. After the king had announced that the war was already lost, Mussolini was voted out of power and General Pietro Badaglio took over as the prime minister of Italy. The Allied invasion of Italy was successful after 38 days of fighting. They were fighting to get the Axis powers out of Sicily, and on September 17, 1943, General Badaglia was voted in as the Prime Minister when Mussolini was voted out, and then on October 13, 1943, the government of Italy declared war on its former Axis partner Germany and joined the battle on the side of the Allies. All of that was because of Luciano. All of that was something that Genovese fought against. So the Allied invasion happens, Mussolini is ousted, Italy is now an Allied power, everything is looking up for everybody except two people, Mussolini and Vito Genovese. Remember, right now he is in Italy on the run from America for a murder charge that he knows is going to go down in America soon. He's just spent the last seven years financially backing the fascist government of Mussolini and supporting him through declaring war on America. This is not good news for Genovese. So when the Allied forces move into Italy, Genovese is like, oh fuck, I am screwed. So he quickly goes to the U.S. Army and he offers support to the U.S. Army. This guy reminds me of the rat from Harry Potter. You know the guy that like literally turns into a rat? His name is Peter Pettigrew. As a human, he acts like a rat. That is exactly who I think of when I think of Vito Genovese. I don't think of his actual picture. I think of Peter Pettigrew. He's like a little rat. I hope this guy is burning in hell right now. So Genovese goes to the U.S. Army and starts making nice with Charles Paletti, a commander in the army who would later become the governor of New York. Genovese gave him a 1938 Packard sedan, and Paletti accepted the car. It cost around $1,100 when the car came out new, which would equal out to about $20,000 today. That's literally chump change. A 22 Honda Civic costs $22,350 MSRP. And keep in mind that he gave him this car in 1943, which means that the car is already five years old. He gave Mussolini $4 million, and he gave America a car that costs less than a Honda Civic today. The sad thing is, America ate this up. They were all about it. This is the Stone Ages, so they literally have, like, no idea who the hell this dude is. They have no idea he's there on the run from a murder charge. They just think he's, like, some Italian dude that probably told him that he had, like, gone to America or something slimy. And they're just like, all right, cool, this dude's gonna, you know, help us out, he's gonna give us stuff, I'll, I'll take it, I'll take a car. They put him into position as an interpreter for the U.S. Army. They can't speak Italian, he can, so they send him on some missions with some troops that they need to interact with the locals. He's also considered a liaison officer, pretty much just meaning that he's helping the troops when they go out on missions, he's helping them. He's translating for them, he's talking to the people for them, he's letting them know like, oh, this is the traditions and customs of these people, so he's just helping the U.S. Army. He quickly becomes one of the AMGOT's most trusted employees. The AMGOT, or the Allied Military Government for Occupied Territories, is pretty much just the decision makers for the Allied forces, and they make decisions on behalf of the Allied forces in country. So Genovese gets together with Caligaro Vizzini, an Italian gangster from the Mafia over in Italy, and they set up a black market operation transporting food commodities. The AMGOT signs off on import and export papers for this illegal transport so it can bring all basic food commodities to Naples and Sicilies and just pretty much bring food commodities to the troops wherever they're at. I'm honestly not 100% sure what's going on here. I, I don't really know because there's not a lot of information on whatever the hell is going on here and I don't know why it's illegal. Like, they're transporting food commodities to American troops. You would think it would be super simple for them to make it legitimate. Like, 
my research also says that like some corrupt army officials would actually make contributions of gasoline and trucks to the operation. But if they're transporting food commodities, I don't know why it would be so illegal. I don't know why an officer would have to be crooked in order to make contributions. So something's going on here that I just I don't know. Luke Monzelli was an American lieutenant in the Carabinieri, assigned to follow Genovese during his time in Italy. He said truckloads of food supplies were shipped from Vizzini to Genovese, all accompanied by proper documentation, which had been certified by men in authority. So again, um, I don't know. I don't see anything saying that they were transporting drugs or anything illegal in these convoys, so... Again, I don't know why it's illegal, but it is. So now things are going splendidly in Italy again. Nobody's bashing Genovese's skull in for financing a regime that supported genocide. Well, whatever. Nobody has realized that he's in Italy on the run from a murder conviction in the United States. He's running a black market convoy of food supplies in Italy. Life is going beautifully for him. In the summer of 1944, shit starts to catch up with him. Karma is a bitch, and you can never run from her for long. Back in the States, mobster Ernest the Hawk Rapolo was arrested for the murder of Baccia. He was facing life in prison, so of course he decided to flip. He gave up Genovese and told the feds that Genovese had him killed so he didn't have to pay the $35,000 for matching him up with the gambler that he ripped off. He also told them where Genovese was. At the same time that this is going on, these black market runs of food commodities that Genovese has been doing in Italy start to not look so innocent. They start investigating it and they're like, oh shit, how did we not see this before? He's been stealing trucks, he's been stealing flour, and he's been stealing sugar from us. We were so blind, we were so cool with this dude, and he's really not a good dude. So now they're pissed. They feel like somebody's gotten something over on them. They feel like he's been robbing them blinds and they supported him and they're they're mad. So when shit starts to go sideways, this dude, Agent Orange C. Dickey of the Criminal Investigation Division, which having been in the army in an MP battalion, let me tell you, those CID boys do not play around. They are not people you want to mess with. They suck. Like, they're the worst of the worst. They arrest you if you do absolutely anything against army rules. You don't have to break the law. You just have to break army rules. I'm talking, if you fail a drug test, you're in there getting fingerprinted and getting your mugshot taken. Full arrest. So this CID dude, Agent Orange, he comes up there and he's looking into Genovese And he knows that he has some history in America because that's what made Genovese approach the American army in the first place. So he's like, all right, something happened in America. He has some ties to America. So now the Americans in Italy give the Americans in America a call. And as soon as the Americans in Italy call the Americans in America, America is like, yo, um, actually, we're glad you called. I'm sure you've never heard of this dude, but there's this bad motherfucker named Vito Genovese, and he fled from America on a murder charge. He's in NOLA. Like, have you heard of him? Do you know anything? And then the Americans in Italy are like, wait, Vito? Vito Genovese? No way. No way. Like, we we kind of had a feeling about this dude. This dude, Agent Orange, has been telling us that something's weird about the dude, and we had a feeling, and it's funny that you said that, because we were actually calling you to ask you about this dude. So yeah, we know who he is, and okay, great. Now we know. Now we both know that he's bad. Now we know that he's on the run from a murder charge. It's not just like, oh, he's robbing, you know, flour and sugar anymore. He killed someone. So, uh... Thanks so much. Makes sense. Let's get this taken care of. So now, Dickie is on the hunt. He wants Genovese and he wants him bad. But the problem is, is that Genovese has already greased the pockets of all the higher-ups of Americans in Italy. And they don't want that to stop. So the Americans in Italy, they're like, eh, eh, so what? Murder? Like, that's not that bad. Okay, he killed someone. Like, do we really care so much? Do we really care so much? He gave us an $1,100 car, okay? They're like, 
murder? So what? So what? Leave him alone. God, you're always trying to arrest someone. You're so annoying. Leave him alone. Like, he's paying us. Shut up. But Dickie is not being deterred. He's on a mission to get this guy. His entire chain of command, I'm talking every single one of them, so a chain of command, I don't know Dickie's rank, it, it never, I really never went looking for his rank, but if you're junior enlisted, you'll have like a sergeant, you'll have a staff sergeant, you'll have a sergeant major, you'll have a BC, a commander, so you got all of these people above you, and that's a chain of command, it's just someone's superiors that are above them and they give the orders to people below them. So now all of Dickie's chain of command are telling him to drop it. They don't care what Genovese did, they just want him to leave it alone because Genovese has been paying them. Dickie is like, nah, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, I'm arresting this man. The people in America gave me permission, and that is what I'm gonna do. The guys in America that gave me permission to arrest him have a lot more rank than you, and I'm doing it. I don't care. Try and stop me. So he goes ahead, and, and this guy's got bullets because he arrests Genovese. When he arrests Genovese to have him sent back, Genovese offers him $250,000 to let him go. And Dickie, again, these CID boys, they're not the ones to play with. Dickie is like, nah, bro, I just worked my ass to get you arrested in the first place. Kick rocks. I don't want your stupid 250 grand. Then Genovese turns around. He's like, hey, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill your whole family. And I'm going to kill anyone you've ever met. Just so you know, if I go to America, everybody you've ever met dies. And still, Dickie's like, nah, ha ha, you going to jail, motherfucker, you ain't gonna do shit. So he sends him back and Genovese goes back to America. Genovese was extradited and arrived back in America on June 1st, 1945. The next day, he was arraigned on the murder charges for the 1934 Baccio killing, and he obviously pled not guilty. There was a few witnesses to the crime and they're all ready to testify that Genovese was the one that gave the order to kill this dude. The first was Peter La Tempa. La Tempa was in protective custody when he was found dead in his jail cell. He had enough poison in him to kill six horses. That is some Jeff Epstein didn't kill himself type shit right there. <laughs> Another was Jerry Esposito, who was found shot to death in New Jersey. Ernest the Hawk Rapolo survived, but without anybody to corroborate his story, there wasn't any chance of getting a murder charge to stick to Genovese. While dismissing the charges against him, the judge made it very clear to Genovese that he really wanted to see him fry in the electric chair. In my opinion, I truly believe that right here, this moment in the story, is where the government flipped Genovese, and I am 100% convinced that he was a rat. So now, while all of this shit is going on, Genovese ran from America away from the murder charges on November 25th, 1936. Costello steps up and he is the acting boss for the Luciano family. Lansky called a meeting of the commission in Havana that December, which would come to be known as the Havana Conference. The representatives said that they were going to see Frank Sinatra perform, but it was really a commission meeting that Luciano would be able to attend. They discussed three topics the heroin trade, Cuban gambling, and the Hotel of Bugsy Seagulls that was failing. Genovese spent a good chunk of time there trying to convince Luciano to take on the role of Capu de Tutti Capi and let him run that role while Luciano was in Cuba. Luciano, at this point, does not trust Genovese. He's quoted as saying, There is no boss of bosses. I turn that down in front of everybody. If I ever change my mind, I will take the title on. But it won't be up to you. Right now, you work for me, and I ain't in the mood to retire. Don't ever let me hear you talk about this again, or I'll lose my temper. Luciano was not secretive about being in Cuba. He was publicly hanging out with Sinatra. He was visiting a ton of nightclubs. There was a lot of things that he was photographed doing. But when the U.S. government finally got intelligence that he was in Cuba, they went to Cuba and threatened them. They told Cuba that as long as Luciano was there, the U.S. would not send any narcotic prescription drugs to them. Two days later, the government of Cuba detained Luciano and put him on a Turkish freighter back to Italy. When he was discovered to have been in Cuba by the U.S. government, he was under the impression that it was Genovese that tipped the U.S. off. I fully believe this. He called Genovese to his room and threw him the beating of a lifetime. 
After Luciano was done with him, Genovese had three broken ribs and was bedridden for three days. We also heard about the possibility that Genovese tipped off the government about the Appalachian meeting after he called the Appalachian meeting himself. How much you want to bet that he ended up getting out of that murder charge because he flipped and it just never got out that he was a rat. There are huge moments, the Havana conference, the Appalachian conference, these are gigantic moments for them underground, especially the Appalachian meeting that he called and just so happened to get raided in one of the highest number of mafia members that were ever arrested at an event in history. It came out that it was like really bad for Genovese. Bad things happened to Genovese because of the Appalachian conference. Bullshit. I guarantee you the government was doing everything they could to make it look like Genovese was not a rat so that he could continue setting these Mafia members up in this way. I guarantee you, Willie Moretti, Costello's underboss and cousin, had syphilis. Back then, a lot of the time, syphilis was a death sentence. It is what killed Al Capone. He was known to be a little bit Looney Tune because of it, and nobody really minded. But Genovese convinced everybody that he had to be killed because he was a liability because of his little Looney Tune act. He rattled on that it was a mercy killing. While Costello was in jail on October 4th, 1951, Genovese went to Joe's elbow room in New Jersey and shot Moretti in the head and the face. This was a really heavy blow for Costello. He loved him, and it came down hard on Costello when he died. Costello got out of jail in 1956. While Costello was in jail, Genovese had been the acting boss on the streets, and when Costello got out of jail, Genovese didn't want to give his position as boss up. In 1957, Genovese and Carlo Gambino, the underboss of the Anastasia family, attacked Frank Costello, who had taken leadership of the family back upon his release from prison. Genovese ordered Vincent de Chin Gigante to execute Costello. Gigante grabbed Costello as he was entering his apartment and shot him in the head. Gigante said, Hey Frank, this one's for you. As Costello turned around to see who had said that, Gigante shot his 38 at Costello's head. But apparently he's a really bad shot or he's just dumb because he yelled out to him beforehand. So when he turned his head, his head wasn't in the same place as when Vincent shot. He was at point blank range, but he barely grazed his head, and Costello lived. Costello did not cooperate with police, but since it was such a public attack, police arrested Gigante for attempted murder. He was later acquitted, and he publicly thanked Costello after the verdict was read out. Costello had no choice in the matter, and he decided to retire and hand over the reins of leadership to Genovese, and Luciano couldn't do anything to stop it. He was under such close scrutiny from police in Italy, he really couldn't do anything. Since it was a peaceful handoff of power, Costello just decided, like, all right, I'm gonna retire. You could have the position of boss if you want it that bad. Since it was peaceful, and since he also hadn't opened his mouth in court and had Gigante sent to prison for the rest of his life, Genovese allowed Costello to live. He didn't put a hit out on him. He didn't bar him from future mafia activity. He really didn't do anything other than take the position of boss of the family. That might be the only halfway decent thing that Genovese ever did in his entire life. After the Frank Costello hit, Joseph Bonanno arranged a sit down between Albert Anastasia and Vito Genovese. He knew that one was needed because Anastasia was a deadly weapon himself. He was leading Murder, Inc., he killed people for fun, he liked it, and Costello was one of Anastasia's closest allies. He was leading the family for Luciano, who was Anastasia's best friend. Anastasia literally owed his life to Luciano, because Luciano stepped in and got Anastasia off of death row so that he could be an enforcer for him, so Anastasia literally owed his life to Luciano. Anastasia was leading his own family. He didn't want the publicity of a public mafia war, so he agreed not to kill him. But Genovese still had a promise to keep. He promised Carlo Gambino that he would help him rise to power and become the boss of his family if Gambino backed him on his power play. Five months later, on October 25th, 1957, while he sat for a cut and a shave at the Park Sheridan Hotel, Albert Anastasia was brutally killed by a group of men. 
Carlo Gambino took over as the leader of the family after Vito Genovese called the Appalachian meeting to order, gathering all the important mafia guys from the entire United States to meet in Appalachia, New York. It was raided and over 130 mafiosi were arrested. Again, the mafia was in the spotlight and every person that was arrested came to be known to the country as being associated with the mafia. I hope this guy is burning in hell right now. Thanks so much for tuning in. I really appreciate it and I hope you enjoyed. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, follow, do all the things, and I'll see you next week. Bye!